Hello everybody, Ash here. Now what you're about to listen to is an episode originally uploaded to the Ear Read This Patreon page. For the moment, I've paused uploads to and payments from the Patreon as I focus on building the main channel. But if you are a patron, you can still access all the bonus content we have on there for free. And if you'd like to support the channel in the meantime, there's a link in the episode description box below. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. I like a man who uses good grammar. You impress me, Mr. Wong. Whom sent you? A man who would rather spill money than blood. But also a man who would not mind spilling blood if he has no other choice. Hello, patrons, and welcome to another exclusive episode of Ear Read This, a secret podcast revealing hidden entrances into our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'll be talking about The Little Sister by Raymond Chandler. Published in 1949, The Little Sister came six years after the last Marlowe novel, which is quite an interval by Chandler's standards, one that was caused by ill health, creative crises, and a bruising stint in Hollywood. It was on the back of this novel that Evelyn Waugh called Chandler the best writer in America. But if you have listened to our episodes on the earlier Marlowe novels, it won't surprise you to hear that Chandler himself had a low opinion of the book. When his publisher, Hamish Hamilton, sent him a specially bound copy of The Little Sister, Chandler said, I do not think my works are worth special binding. Chandler was frequently dismissive of his output, and he maintained a particularly low opinion of The Little Sister, something critics like Keith Newlin have agreed with, saying the novel marks a progressive decline degenerating into caricature. Others like Mircea Mihaz hold the novel as Chandler's overlooked masterpiece, and despite the author's struggles writing The Little Sister, it was a success upon publication. Chandler earned $10,000 for the novel's serialisation in The Cosmopolitan, and it brought him favourable reviews too, particularly from Britain and France. The Cosmopolitan won the serial rights only after the New York Post and Colliers had declined, with enthusiasm, as Chandler put it. The serial first appeared in April of 1949, to Chandler's immense displeasure. The magazine had edited and apparently rewritten sections of his story. The abridgment, he wrote, in the current Cosmopolitan is quite horrible. I expected them to leave almost everything out, but I did not expect them to stick in their own material. This must have been all the more depressing given Chandler's recent brush with Hollywood. He had returned to writing prose to escape exactly this sort of constrictive meddling from producers, directors and actors. More than any other Marlowe outing, The Little Sister is a Hollywood novel and has been traditionally characterised by critics as Chandler's way of unleashing his frustrations on the film business. The author himself described it as a piece of rather gaudy sarcasm masquerading as a murder mystery. The story concerns a missing photographer called Orin Quest, whose disappearance is brought to Marlowe's attention by Orin's sister, Orphame. Marlowe's investigation brings him into contact with another Quest sibling, their half-sister, Layla, a famous actress who performs under the screen name Mavis Weld. Through Mavis, we meet shady, out-of-town gangsters, seductresses, and a chorus line of hams. It is a novel that has much to do with hamming. It looks at professional hams and perennial hams, and wonders whether hams are born or made. The novel distinguishes itself among the author's other work in being more overtly drawn from life, There are frequent references to real stars, as when Marlowe speaks in a voice like Orson Welles with his mouth full of crackers. Chandler even felt it necessary to give the novel a disclaimer. The people and events in this book are not entirely fictional, he wrote. Some of the events happened, although not in this precise time or place, and certain of the characters were suggested by real persons, both living and dead. Not only real-life film stars, but real-life gangsters like Bugsy Siegel and Mickey Cohen are Chandlerised as Sonny Mo Steen and Weepy Moya. Surrounded by hams and dim reflections, Marlowe suffers a prolonged identity crisis, but emerges as more of a real person than we have ever seen him before. Today we will discuss Chandler's increasing pessimism, analyse his conflicted feelings about the film industry, and evaluate whether or not The Little Sister is an unsung masterpiece, or as Chandler felt, something of a runt among its heartier siblings. So, uh, number five, we're now up to, Little Sister. Yes. What did you make of it? What were your first thoughts? It's got all of the hallmarks of all the other ones, Mm. even right down to there being shady doctors and gangsters and Mm. police interference and all of that a lot of familiar ground you know in um which one was it 
where we were talking about how much he hates phonies in a slightly Caulfield esque mm-hmm. way. I think it was the high window. Yeah. He, he, he seems kind of neurotic about fakes, <laughs> which makes sense because it's the one about a counterfeit yep. coin. This one is just off the scale. <laughs> The amount of sort of calling out people for acting and uh, oh god, he hates the genuine. industry. Well, he um, Chandler did. He did a lot of um, screenwriting, didn't he? He did. And uh, when I spoke to Tom Williams, his his biographer, he he said, you know, Little Sister was basically the book that he he wrote after he became completely jaded <laughs> with the film industry and fell out with people like Billy Wilder yeah. and um, and Hitchcock, and so right th- wrote this sort of acid attack on. <laughs> on all things Hollywood. Julian Simmons has complimented the little sister for having a plot as smoothly dovetailed as a piece of Chippendale. This is something Chandler would have had a hard time believing. He considered plot one of his most persistent weaknesses and wrote, the fact is there is nothing in the little sister but style and dialogue and characters. The plot creaks like a broken shutter in an October wind. Thinking about this while reading Chandler, I have to keep asking myself how much I care about the plot. If I look back over these first five Marlowe novels, the highlights reel is heavy on moments, on jokes, on snatches and snarls of dialogue, on his imagery motifs, on the fizzing flash portraits of his walk-on parts, and the gradually developing portraits of Marlowe and Los Angeles. Maybe the high window was the most successful in binding Chandler's thematic obsessions, how to tell a fake from the genuine article, and the plot, the adventures of a counterfeit coin. But on the whole, revelations of the story are not what I remember most immediately or with most pleasure. Although he worried about plot a great deal, the way in which Chandler wrote explicitly prioritised style, the never-ending quest for that diamond line. He wrote on small note cards, ensuring he could get at least one memorable joke or image every few sentences. As Tom Williams says, this left him with a surplus of wonderful moments, some of which either did not fit the plot or added nothing to it. Picturing Marlowe on the case, I tend to see him encountering ruins of plot structures, all the more unsettling for being half-buried or incomplete. Sometimes these feel like ancient ruins. The tale of Moose Malloy in Farewell My Lovely, for instance, feels like it maps out a tragic fall in the classical style. And as Peter Wolfe writes of Orphame in The Little Sister, her journey to Southern California recalls her namesake's descent into Hades. Elsewhere, we have Arthurian resonances jutting out of the mists, the recurring theme of a buried Merlin, the quests, the grails, the games of chess inevitably evoking a grander game in which Marlowe is a mere player. Conceived of this way, plot begins to sound like what Marlowe longs for in his hometown. Real cities have something else, he says, some individual bony structure under the muck. Los Angeles has Hollywood and hates it. It's not only classical ruins he picks through, but the bits and pieces of Chandler's own recycled plots. In the case of The Little Sister, material is reused from the short story Bay City Blues, which he'd already raided for The Lady in the Lake. That novel was lambasted for the creakiness of its plot, and yet, in terms of atmosphere and thematic concentration, it strikes me as somehow more convincing than a book like The Big Sleep. As Clive James wrote of Chandler, the secret of plausibility lies in the style. In his letters, Chandler once asked, Does an author feel bound to catch his murderer? Yes, if he is writing a formal mystery. Otherwise, the story is an unresolved chord. If he is merely writing a novel of character, which uses the mystery form merely for sensational effect, I think not. In his short stories and early novels, Chandler proved himself eminently capable of constructing a mystery plot. But with later novels, like The Little Sister, he either found the plotting more difficult or had lost interest in it. It seems like The Little Sister was the closest he came to writing that outright novel of character. And perhaps the reason for this is that Chandler wanted a tonic for his experience in Hollywood. After returning to his own prose, he said, I'm trying to finish a Marlowe story, but I'm so in love with mere words and phrases after writing dialogue for jerks that I'll probably forget all about the plot. Although he toyed with leaving the novel on an unresolved chord, he eventually decided it was too risky to disappoint his mystery readers and wrapped up his plot in a few rushed final chapters. Where would you... We we started a tradition last time of ranking them, and I'm curious to see... I'm curious to Mm -hmm. see how it holds as we reach the sort of final few books. Because these are the ones... I think I've got much more... much more of a connection to the the first few in the series 
I think the last time I read these, I was really rushing through them. I think by this point in the series, he's trodden a lot of ground he's trodden before. And they just didn't hold in my memory as well as some of the, you know, as like the high window or the big sleep. Like mm. we're getting into like the later ones, which are definitely less iconic. I think so. There's a few things that really stick out like an ice pick yeah. from a bald guy's head <laughs> or neck. <laughs> The ice pick killings really stick out about this. They it do. seems very. It really reminded me of what was the film that spoofed the the killer walking around, uh, and it's like shot from the killer's point of view. Was it Police Squad or um, Naked Gun? If I was about to say Naked Gun. I think yeah. it's Naked Gun. There's a ridiculous long gun. opening where it's looking at a killer's feet and then he suddenly like glides over something. Yeah. Just, like, all this kind of ridiculous stuff happens. That's exactly like the opening of Police Squad, so it would not surprise me if it was Naked Gun. Yeah, it's something about uh, ice pick killers just seems very uh, sort of like cheesy TV <laughs> crime, you know, diagnosis murder kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Where, where, where does your ranking now of these five? Big Sleep is still my number one. I've... Probably okay. completely forgotten what order my list in was in was in last time, and we'll, well, that's I think was interesting because I have too. So we'll see. Well, I think now in retrospect, and it's now been almost a year since I've read some of the earlier ones. So, so I still think it's it's almost coming in in order. I reckon. I think yeah, Big Sleep, then then Farewell, My Lovely, then The High Window. Maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking too hard about this. Lady, Lady in the Lake is the yeah, it's not my number four. And then this one's coming in at number five. It's not because I enjoyed it less, just that I enjoyed the other ones more. Mm. There is there is something irrepressible about the early ones, mm. and the, which is replaced with a darkness in these. Definitely. Like the, I think the darkness is necessary, really. It's hard to imagine him just staying kind of light as a feather. Yeah. Not that they're light as a feather, because they aren't, but, but, but that kind of boundless comic energy, the thing that really is electrifying in Farewell, My Lovely. I'm not sure if that could could really hold up with the um with, over time mm -hmm. or maybe it could like pg roadhouse <laughs> that's sort <laughs> yeah. of pg roadhouse isn't it that doesn't doesn't get darker <laughs> but but maybe it's the it's a, a byproduct of what marlo marlo's life's like surrounded with murder and death and secrets and lies and loneliness you know there isn't much of that in pg roadhouse <laughs> as well <laughs> well they're sort of around the same time right oh no when when yeah yeah no you're you're right they they they're born born around the same time i think i think pg roadhouse is a bit older because you know they were they went to the same yeah. school dulwich college pg roadhouse was in before him was pg so pg roadhouse was writing later about the past right when he was writing about the 20s he was actually in the 40s or 50s yeah but he, i think he also was doing it in the mm. 20s i think the thing is pg roadhouse started earlier and carried on later because he was he was very yeah. long lived so raymond chandler despite being younger was published later than pg roadhouse and then was obviously dead before roadhouse yeah. died Though Marlowe is, if anything, even more bitter than he was in The Lady in the Lake, The Little Sister is a noticeably funnier novel. Like Wodehouse, Chandler worked wonders with the simile, and I humbly submit the following as his masterpiece. The room was suddenly full of heavy silence, like a fallen cake. Comedy in Chandler's fiction is generated by the contrast between Marlowe's heightened sensibilities and the world they are stimulated by. As Clive James said, in A Democracy of Trash, Marlowe was the only aristocrat. Only Marlowe could make a reference to Browning and feel the need to clarify the poet, not the automatic. Chandler's novels have their own comic obsessions. The jokes in The Little Sister seem to be particularly energised by the subject of furriness and detachable hair. A man with a toupee, for instance, is the focus of a great deal of attention. What happens to people that get tough with you? Marlowe asks him. You make them hold your toupee? Elsewhere, Marlowe talks to furry voices on the phone. We see a hat that had been taken from its mother too young and a scarf you could have found in the dark by listening to it purr. When Orphame tells Marlowe her brother used to wear a little blonde moustache until their mother made him cut it off, Marlowe interjects with, don't tell me, the minister needed it to stuff a cushion. I, I, this is the first one I read where I was remembering, I, where I, I realized I didn't remember most of it. Like I'd, I'd actually forgotten, you know, the twist and the solution to this one, which I hadn't mm -hmm. in the previous one. So it was almost like reading it again. There were bits where yeah. I was just like, oh no, I remember that. I remember the optometrist, but there were bits that I just didn't, you know, just didn't stick in my head at all. I don't think I said anything against the book. 
I just think my mindset when I was, I read them all in a fever, you yeah. know, and I think once we were getting to the end of the, the series, I mean, what's next? Um, Long Goodbye? Um, Long Goodbye, yeah. Yeah, I have I completely forgotten the plot of that one. So that one is going to be like reading it again. Well, I've just read it, so it's very fresh for me. But oh, I had... I. I think before we started this, you know, I only think I'd, I had, I hadn't, I don't think I'd read The Little Sister. And uh, Long Goodbye is maybe the first one I read. They're, they're getting really muck, um, muddled up in my mind because I've just started reading the short stories. Oh, God. And, yeah. and I've been reading the ones for, that, that are sort of the prompts, you know, the, the, the short stories that he builds his novels out of. Mm-hmm. So I've re- I've read one that basically is the one that he built the little sister into, and that now it's completely confused because I, I can see the ending like two ways kind yeah. of thing. The writing of the little sister was plagued with difficulties, and Chandler frequently had to break off from the project. Not only was he recovering from his experiences in Hollywood, but both he and his wife developed severe cases of flu, especially dangerous for Sissy, who had long-standing lung issues, soon to be diagnosed as incurable fibrosis. To compound the physical and emotional strain of this, Chandler was realising what he had lost by leaving the film industry. Not only the money, but also a vibrant social life. Away from Paramount, Chandler was isolated and maudlin. As a consequence, he opened up more in letters to friends. In The Little Sister, Marlowe acknowledges a similar impulse. Yes, I talk too much. Lonely men always talk too much. Constantly worried that his former spark had left him, Chandler imposed on himself the sort of strictures you'd expect of a novice author. According to his biographer, Tom Williams, he set a routine, sitting in his study each morning, the time of day where he felt he wrote best. The deal he struck with himself was that, if he was not writing, he could do nothing else. The boredom, he hoped, would prompt the words to flow. It worked, and he began to move forward with the stalled novel. You're right, it does feel like he's returning to old ground because, of course, The Lady in the Lake was this big excursion out to the country, yeah. which felt really different and weird. And uh, this one is um, obviously a return to home soil. Yeah, well, um, this isn't the first time that he's taken a swing at seedy media types. You know, there's the creepy photographers in the high window. There are the people who... What is the name of that bar that Moose Malloy destroys florians yeah and that's sort of very much a kind of place where the the elite go oh no sorry no florians is the one at the start you know with that an amazing opening oh yeah which is the um he goes there he goes there at least once in one of the i can't remember he takes a he takes a swing at those like the night spots for fake people yeah actually isn't isn't in farewell my lovely doesn't he go to that uh you know the posh guy's house who ends up killed Mm mm-hmm and he says he points out points out a painting and says it's it's called blah 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 blah. And Marla replies, "Oh, I thought it was two warts on a fanny." <laughs> um, so yeah, he's always had this thing in for elites and the 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 sort of it is a pretentiousness, but it's particularly when he thinks they're fake. There's one there's one moment in this one where he starts taking the piss out of a guy because he is behaving groggier than he should be after Marlowe's punched him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's that neurotic about it that he's like, "Oh, you're really milking it as I'm beating you up." It's, it's. <laughs> he's got such an issue about it. Another throwback to Bay City in this one, which is interesting. He's, he, yeah. He says every time I have to go to Bay City, I have to buy a new head. <laughs> <laughs> because he's been coshed so many times. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I think our cosh theory is really coming together. Is Bay Bay City is where he wakes up in a shady doctor's, isn't it? Yeah, in farewell, my lovely. Yeah, and he he goes he goes to see a medical practitioner of sorts this time, as well. Mm. So there is that there is that connection too. You know, he goes to see the the optometrist in in air quotes. During his stint in Hollywood, Chandler had written screenplays for films like Double Indemnity and The Blue Dahlia. He had a fractious working relationship with Billy Wilder and bristled at having his writing suddenly subjected to the guidance of a younger man. Wilder later said the two former colleagues he was asked about most were Raymond Chandler and Marilyn Monroe. From Wilder's description of his partnership with the novelist, we get a sense of how far from ideal it would have been for a man of Chandler's temperament. I would guide the structure and I would also do a lot of the dialogue, and he would then comprehend and start constructing too. Despite all of his annoyances detailed in The Little Sister, Chandler would be later tempted back to Hollywood to work on a draft of Strangers on a Train. But his relationship with Hitchcock was, if anything, even worse, and it deteriorated completely after Chandler called him a fat bastard. 
Chandler was easily incensed by affectation. Billy Wilder's Malachar Kane was an article he found particularly vexing. Instead of confronting the director, Chandler sent Paramount a list of complaints against Wilder, saying that he was rude, drinking, and spending a lot of time either chatting to young girls on the phone or having sex with them. Chandler also demanded that if he were to return to the studio, Mr. Wilder was at no time to swish under Mr. Chandler's nose or to point in his direction the thin, leather-handled Malachar cane, which Mr. Wilder was in the habit of waving around while they worked. This cane ended up being swished about instead in the pages of The Little Sister by the pretentious agent of Mavis Weld, attracting Marlowe's sneers. Throughout the novels, we have seen Marlowe repulsed and impressed in equal measure by people's ability to act a part. In The Little Sister, descriptions of hamming don't just apply to people in front of the camera. There is a great deal of ham to be found behind it. In Ned Gammon, the director, and even the optometrist, Dr. Hambleton. Nothing like a little hamming to clear the air, says Ned at one point, highlighting the industry's need to reassure itself. Or as Chandler put it in an article, its frantic desire to kiss itself on the back of its neck. In the same piece, he said, actors are threatened people. Before films came along to make them rich, they often had need of a desperate gaiety. Some of these qualities, prolonged beyond a strict necessity, have passed into the Hollywood moors and produced that very exhausting thing, the Hollywood manner, which is a chronic case of a spurious excitement over absolutely nothing. A character's manner can tell Marlowe more about their morals than their rap sheet. As John Paul Athanasurellis has written, In Chandler's ethical universe, a criminal who makes no bones about his illegitimate actions is superior to ostensibly law-abiding hypocrites. Do you want to do a plot rundown of this one, then? It's a bit of a, a foxy plot. It's but, convoluted. I mean, let's do the premise. We don't, we don't have to walk all yeah. the way through it. But the, the premise is, I mean, it's the ultimate start, really. Yeah. It's as on brief a start as there is, there is in the series. A dame walks in. A dame walks in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With the ludicrous name of Orpha May Quest. Well, I just finished reading not too long ago. I've been reading uh, Doris Lessing. Oh, yeah. Children, Which of, one? Children of Violence, the whole series. Okay. And that's yeah. got a character. Main character's surname is Quest. Mm. So I think it's very much a... I've never met anyone in real life with the surname Quest. I think it's a very on-the-nose name for a character in a book well yeah where, where we've had grail we've had chess yep this is it's more on a theme yeah but i'm surprised you haven't brought up or for me well it's i've i am not i'm so beyond being surprised by his naming <laughs> yeah um so anyway she is she's a um out of town gal she's from manhattan kansas <laughs> and manhattan, um, kansas yeah and she comes into uh, Marlowe's offices to try and track down her brother, who is a photographer, <laughs> who's gone missing. And she is, uh, Orpha May is very uh, timid and and faux naive. And, and she's really, she sort of sets up the rest of the book because Marlowe from the off is riled by what he sees as her putting on, her act, putting on an act. Mm -hmm. And uh, as luck would have it, the case takes him uh, into basically Hollywoodville and he's meeting lots of people who are putting on acts. I mean, he, to be fair, he, he's, he meets people who are putting on acts in every single book. Oh, I've yeah. just remembered, you know, the high window, not... Did you mention there were photographers in it? I yes. can't remember the photographers. Well, they were... Who, um, who were they? They kidnap the younger sister and force her to pose nude. Oh, yeah, no, that's the big sleep. Big sleep, sorry, yeah. In the high window, though, there is like a Hollywood couple, isn't yeah. there? Because they're the ones with the dog Heathcliff. <laughs> yeah, I've which is the bit I'd I forgotten the remember. dog was called Heathcliff. Yeah, they've got Heathcliff, the golden spaniel, I think it is, or blonde spaniel. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, anyway, he's he's meeting lots of of Hollywood people, producers, and an actress called Mavis Weld. Yeah, and her um, her friend Dolores Gonzalez. <laughs> There's some great names in this one. Yeah, he uh, he meets all of these women. Now, it it there is a nastiness to this one. I think there is a. Increase, uh, we saw it a little bit in Lady in the Lake, but slightly more brutish towards women. In fact, a lot more brutish yeah. towards women, I would say. In a quite un Marlowe way, in, in some ways that are surprising, some ways that aren't. Hating fakes is nothing new, but he, he um, he's quite sexually aggressive towards Dolores in particular, mm -hmm. which hasn't really... You know, we've talked about in the past the way that Marlowe and women goes. He wants yeah. to save them platonically or have a sad, doomed affair. 
Yeah, no, there's no other options. No, and he's so rarely the instigator, isn't he? Well, this one is also very much in the the Marlowe style in that when he does solve it, it's way too late. <laughs> like, he figures it out, and then he's just like, oh, well. Oh, so that was it, yeah. Yeah, everyone's fucking dead, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he pretty much lets the last person go. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely got a new sort of bitterness, I think. Yeah, I think that, yeah, this, this is definitely... Chandler is more jaded end of the spectrum, you're right. In a letter to James Sando, Raymond Chandler wrote that The Little Sister was the only book of mine that I have actively disliked. It was written in a bad mood, and I think that comes through. It did for critic Anthony Boucher, who condemned the book's scathing hatred of the human race. Boucher goes too far in calling it hatred, but Chandler can certainly scathe it up with the best of them. Women, particularly domineering, seductive and performative women, catch most of the flack. Marlowe obsesses about their particular brand of hamming and how naturally they pick it up, recoiling from the faint provocative smile that nobody ever has to teach them. When one of these women fluffs their lines or performs her part woodenly, he is always quick to criticise. She laughed. I guess it was a silvery tinkle where she was. It sounded like somebody putting away saucepans where I was. There has always been something rather prudish about Marlowe's disapproval of women he deems sexually provocative. Chandler himself comes off a bit crowing and sour when he writes about the mincing elocution of the glamour queens before adding in gossipy brackets, you ought to hear them with four martinis down the hatch. And there is something newly cantankerous about Marlowe in The Little Sister. It comes as a surprise to be reminded he is only 38. He grumbles and refers to his own decrepitude as if he were much more like Chandler's age of 60. Marlowe's transformation into a curmudgeon seems to be complete when he launches into a lengthy moan about the noisiness of his fellow citizens. The blatting of the radio, the whining of their spoiled children, the gabble of their silly wives. Yet, as John Paul Athanasurellis says, this is strategically placed as a kind of purgative for the misanthropic thoughts of a man who has, after all, recently witnessed the results of a grisly murder. This chapter-long rant is punctuated five times by the self-recriminating refrain, you're not human tonight, Marlowe. And if he is not human, what is he? His crisis has been a few books in the making. If we think back to the high window, it ended with Marlowe rescuing Merle and returning her to the safety of Kansas, away from Los Angeles. Leaving Merle with her vague, kind, patient parents, Marlowe was in a romantic frame of mind. I had a funny feeling as I saw the house disappear, as though I had written a poem and it was very good, and I had lost it and would never remember it again. Unlike Los Angeles, Wichita, Kansas is quiet and safe. Merle has history there she can rely upon. People are simple and trustworthy. From the first, Marlowe has described his home city as if it sets a global standard for seediness and vice, that compared to Los Angeles, just about anywhere is an idyll. It is the city that corrupts its people and turns them into hypocrites and hams. Anthony Butcher is quite wrong to say that Marlowe has hatred for the human race. He has consistently behaved as if, however doomed a quest it might be, humanity is worth saving. His whole livelihood indicates this. As Chandler said, why does Marlowe work for such a pittance? The answer to that is the whole story. Beneath all the scathing and scorn, Marlowe believes people are capable of goodness. As long as there are havens in the world like Wichita, Kansas, states of innocence are at the very least feasible. But this belief has been subjected to a slap of cold water in the last book, The Lady in the Lake, in which evil was seen to thrive even in the most superficially idyllic location. Now in The Little Sister, the gangsters are from out of town, the hamming is learnt intuitively, and the most ruthless huckster of all hails from Kansas. Marlowe has gradually learnt that people don't have to be born in LA to be born bad. One of his bleakest observations comes when he finds the corpse of Orin Quest. Something had happened to his face and behind his face. The indefinable thing that happens in that always baffling and inscrutable moment. The smoothing out, the going back over the years to the age of innocence. The face now had a vague inner amusement, an almost roguish life at the corners of the mouth. All of which was very silly, because I knew damn well, if I ever knew anything at all, that Orin P. Quest had not been that kind of boy. Now, one thing I really want to ask you, if you oh, yeah. highlighted, dropped the book, threw it across the room, sh- shouted, hallelujah. This book has a double kosh. Yes. He bloody gets koshed again. Twice. He, but he, he gets koshed twice in a paragraph. <laughs> he gets, yeah. uh, it's, with a, it's with a 
barrel uh, butt of a gun, to be fair. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he gets uh, basically double coshed. <laughs> state of that guy's cranium at this point doesn't bear thinking about. Or he should have really toughened up to it at this point. Why does the coshing still have the same effect it does the first, second, third time yeah. he was coshed? Surely he's built up a bit of leathery skin on the back of his head so he doesn't get coshed so much anymore. <laughs> I'm afraid I've found some kind of mass on the back of your head. I, I don't <clears> think <throat> it's anything to worry about. It's just like solid rock. Have you been coshed recently? It's like Multiple a, times? It's like a... <laughs> have you been coshed every day of your life for the last <laughs> 25 years it's like oh. a terry's chocolate orange <laughs> <laughs> oh well no he um yeah he gets a double coshing i can't quite remember yeah. does he fade in and then wake up somewhere else again no he wakes up in the same place because i think that is that that's how i would label a traditional coshing is chandler mm. can't figure out how to do a scene transition so he just coshes him and then he wakes up in a new area to do new things yeah, co- coshed and transported. <laughs> no, and, and I suppose, actually, that the double kosh is evidence that he is learning how to take it better because the first kosh doesn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since we've talked about film adaptations, and I was going to oh, yeah. ask you if you've I don't seen know anything. Any... I don't know anything about film adaptations for this one. No, I don't. Did he offend film people too much? Nobody wanted to touch it. Qu- possibly, but he was still, I think, quite. I think his name still ha- had carried some power, and I think they made subsequent films whilst he was still around. So, unless it was the specifically the content of this one and the mm-hmm. fact that it was so clearly an attack on on Hollywood people, I'm sure there is a film. I'm sh- I'm sure I've seen somewhere that there's adaptations of all of the novels. Um, whether there is one that's like you know a close contemporary of the novel like there is of uh lady in the lake in fact all of the others they're not all called the same but yeah all of the books so far have been made into films pretty damn quick and well within chandler's lifetime apart from this one well maybe this one has i just i, sh- I should have just looked it up shouldn't i i don't think it has uh, actually i'm looking it up i'm looking it up just now no no uh there was a Story was updated for the 1969 film Marlowe. Okay, so it's based loosely on The Little Sister. But there isn't a film called The Little Sister. No. Oh. The guy who plays Marlowe also played Jim Rockford in The Rockford Files. Oh, right. James Garner. Yeah. Interesting. So it's a pre- precursor to The Rockford Files. Clive James has written, Much as he would have hated the imputation, Chandler's toil in the salt mines under the Paramount Mountain had done things for him. We've talked a lot about the gaudy sarcasm he directed at the film industry, but Chandler's respect for the medium also gave him a new theme. In The Little Sister, I particularly love the recurring cross-medium references to visuals, a light motif in every sense. To start with, there are the photographs used to blackmail Mavis Weld. They were taken by Orin using a Leica camera, which is praised for its ability to take pictures in any kind of light. Functioning, in other words, like an investigation, lighting up what has been hidden in darkness. And it gets better. The murdered Dr. Hambleton is a retired optometrist. In other words, he is someone who has left the field of vision. My favourite moment comes when Marlowe is wearing mirrored glasses, almost as if he has become a piece of photographic equipment himself. Bear in mind, by this time, Marlowe had been represented on film. The Big Sleep had come out in 1946, starring Humphrey Bogart in the lead. But Chandler had always maintained the closest physical fit for Marlowe was Cary Grant. And in The Little Sister, when someone tells Marlowe to take those silly mirror glasses off, they add, they don't make you look in the least like Cary Grant. Chandler was serious about film, saying it is the only art at which we of this generation have any possible chance to greatly excel. His frustrations with the industry don't only come from the gaudiness and affectation, but the wasting of the medium's potential. As he said, the motion picture is bad because 90% of its source material is tripe, and the other 10% is a little too virile and plain-spoken for the putty-minded clerics, the elderly ingenues of the women's clubs, and the tender guardians of that god-awful mixture of boredom and bad manners, known more eloquently as the impressionable age. As a writer fixated on ideas to do with playing roles, film was not only a literal but a metaphoric goldmine. As John Paul Athanasurelis has written, in having Marlowe refer to police detectives Christy French and Fred Beefus of the LAPD as a kind of hard-boiled Laurel and Hardy, Chandler underscores role consciousness on the part of these policemen. They are able, as is Marlowe, to step back and analyse their profession, determined to play out their roles in the best manner possible, despite the faulty quality of the script. 
The characters in The Little Sister are constantly analysing each other's roles, and Marlowe himself doesn't escape criticism. I thought detectives always wrote things down in little notebooks, Orpha May prompts him. Later, Joseph P. Toad says, I suppose you realise we're just a couple of bit players, Mr. Marlowe. That's all. Just a couple of bit players. In a 1946 letter to Alfred Knopf, Chandler wrote, I have learnt a lot from Hollywood. Please do not think I completely despise it, because I don't. It is a great subject for a novel. Probably the greatest still untouched. Overall, I think I would, I would so far put this one fifth. Not to be down on it, there is lots to enjoy, but yeah. you can't really replace the exuberance of the early ones and the, just the weirdness of yeah. Lady in the Lake. I think I'd still go, I don't know if it's still go. I don't know what I said last time, but I, I know I went Farewell My Lovely Top and that's still true. Yeah, I know you like that one. I think High Window, I think High Window maybe next and then either Big Sleep or Lady in the Lake around three and four and then, and then this one. Um, really excited to do The Long Goodbye now. Yeah, I, I reckon that I think the long goodbye will actually unsettle that pattern because I yeah. reckon that because I'll be reading it almost as new, I might get more out of it rather than yeah. remembering remembering the twist halfway through and then the second half not being as fun. Cool. Well, um, should we leave it there until the long goodbye? Until the long and good goodbye till the long goodbye. Goodbye, a short goodbye until the long goodbye. Let's hope. And uh, yeah, uh, let us know which has been your favourite so far. Um, we'd love to hear your rankings and your um, where what you feel about each series, particularly these ones now that they're getting a bit sort of weirder and sadder and <laughs> brutish. <laughs> yeah, all getting very sad. Yeah, it is getting a bit sad, isn't it? I suspect it's only going to get sadder. Oh, because he's, he, um, he's 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 getting older. He's getting slower. He's getting coshed more regularly. Yeah, the saddest thing of all was he's get, he's growing used to being cushed. Yeah, where it's it's not even it doesn't give him the thrill it once did. Well, we'll be keeping a cosh counter for next time, and um, until then, watch watch the back of your head.